what about on the animal side? The ones that uh, figured out how to move efficiently. Is there anything you find inspiring or beautiful in the movement of any I do have a favorite example. Okay. <laughs> so it sort of goes with the passive walking idea. So is there, you know, how, how energy efficient are animals? Okay, there's a great series of experiments by George Lauder at Harvard and Mike Tranafilo at MIT. They were studying fish swimming in a water tunnel, mm -hmm. okay? And one of these, the type of fish they were studying were these rainbow trout because they, there was a phenomenon well understood that rainbow trout, when they're swimming upstream at mating season, they kind of hang out behind the rocks. And it looks like, I mean, that's tiring work swimming upstream. They're hanging out behind the rocks. Maybe there's something energetically interesting there. So they tried to recreate that. They put in this water tunnel, a rock, basically, a cylinder that had the same sort of vortex street, mm -hmm. the eddies coming off the back of the rock that you would see in a stream. And they put a real fish behind this and watched how it swims. And the amazing thing is that if you watch from above, what the fish swims when it's not behind a rock, it has a particular gait. You can identify the fish the same way you look at a human looking at, walking down the street, you sort of have a sense of how a human walks. The fish has a characteristic gait. You put that fish behind the rock, its gait changes. And what they saw was that it was actually resonating and kind of surfing between the vortices. Yeah. Now, here was the experiment that really was the clincher because there was still, it wasn't clear how much of that was mechanics of the fish, how much of that is control, the brain. So the clincher experiment, and maybe one of my favorites to date, although there are many good experiments, they took, they, this was now a dead fish. Um, they took a dead fish. <laughs> they put a yeah. string that went, that tied the mouth of the fish to the rock so it couldn't go back and get caught in the grates. Uh, and then they asked, what would that dead fish do when it was hanging out behind the rock? And so what you'd expect, it sort of flopped around like a dead fish in the, in the vortex wake until something sort of amazing happens. And this video is worth putting in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. What happens? Uh, the dead fish basically starts swimming upstream, right? It's completely dead, no brain, no motors, no control, but it somehow the mechanics of the fish resonate with the vortex street and it starts swimming upstream. It's one of the best examples ever. What, who do you give credit for that too? Is that just evolution constantly just figuring out by killing a lot of generations of animals, uh, like the most efficient motion? Is that, uh, or maybe the f physics of our world completely like, it's like if evolution applied not only to animals, but just the entirety of it somehow drives to efficiency, like nature likes efficiency. I don't know if that question even makes any sense. I understand the question. That's the reason, I mean, <laughs> do they co-evolve? Um, yeah, somehow co, yeah. Like, I, I don't know if an environment can evolve, but. Um, I mean, there are experiments that people do careful experiments that show that um, animals can adapt to unusual situations and recover efficiency. So there seems like at least in one direction, I think there is reason to believe that the animal's motor system um, and probably its mechanics uh, adapt in order to be more efficient. But efficiency isn't the only goal, of course. Um, sometimes it's too easy to think about only efficiency, but we have to do a lot of other things first, not get eaten, and then, all other things being equal, try to save energy.